Hi, this is Visitor's Book and I'm Maya, your host. In this program, we're going to be meeting with foreigners and diplomats who are here in Pakistan, and we're going to find out what they really think about the country. So let's go. So today we're meeting with Alexander Forte, the head of office at German Red Cross, and his wife Jennifer, and they should be around somewhere here, so let's go find them. Nice to meet you. So nice to meet you. Hi. Hi, I'm Jennifer. Hi. Okay, so you came with your bikes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we live quite close, so it's always fun to, to come and have a ride yeah. in the park. Okay, so this is like a regular Saturday thing for you guys? Yeah, yeah. sometimes, yeah. Cool. So, how long have you been here in Pakistan? Not that long, right? No, uh, I've been here about six months now. Okay. And I've been here two months. Wow, so new arrivals. Yes, <laughs> quite. So, um, what did you expect the country to be like before you got here? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, to be perfectly honest, um, I had a lot of misconceptions about Pakistan. I think. Yeah, me too. Okay. Um, well, what was the idea that you had in your Well, mind? I mean, we lived in uh, uh, in Afghanistan before. We we met in Afghanistan. Yeah. And wow. you know, with Pakistan being the next door neighbor, and and also you always hear about you know Pakistan and Afghanistan not really getting along. Yeah. We had an impression that it was going to be quite similar, huh. actually. Yeah. yeah. And it's um, definitely not. It's yeah. not. Yeah. It's completely not, not. Not at all. Not one bit. Very different. Yeah. And where are you guys from, both of you? Well, <laughs> uh, that's kind of a long story for okay. both of us. Yeah. Um, I'm originally from the U.S., but okay. uh, Hong Kong is my home. All right. So I've been there for the last 13 years. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And I am. German and I was born in Germany, but I've spent uh, the vast majority of my life abroad. So right. I was about two months old when I left Germany. Oh wow! And I didn't come back until I was 19. So. Okay, <laughs> so oh, all right, I see. Wow, interesting story. And yeah, so you told me that you met in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. That's quite unusual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were um, actually both part of a motorcycle club in Kabul. Wow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, there were just a handful of us uh, expats who did not have major security restrictions mm. and uh, we all got motorcycles and would drive around every Friday and yeah. um, he showed up one day and I said well I want to know him. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. so cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay and um, how long ago was that? Uh, that was in 2015. Okay. Yeah. And then you got married. Yes. yes. Now, how did you end up in Pakistan? Like what made you want to leave? Uh, that was okay. <laughs> well, um, I wanted to leave Afghanistan to go back to grad school okay. um, to have a career change. Yeah. And he was kind of being transferred from his company to a different office. Mm -hmm. um, and then many things happened. I went back home to Hong Kong. He went to Iraq. And then when it came time to choose his new assignment, I was the one I really wanted to come to Pakistan. Well, we should explain also that it's because Jennifer, um, her her thesis that she did at grad mm. school had to do with uh, Afghan Hazar refugees that end up in Indonesia but have come from Quetta. So yeah. she had a, a very stark interest in, uh, yeah. in Pakistan. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, so interesting. Uh, it was, um, I really pushed him to come here. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And like, so you said you had a lot of misconceptions, but mm. would you say there was anything in particular that really surprised you about Pakistan? It's so safe here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I ride my bike to the Markaz. I ride my bike to the gym. Yeah. I walk around by myself. Um, and. It's, it's just not a big deal at all. So I really thought it was going to be more like, more Kabul, like Kabul, yeah. and it, it's just not at all. You can't even compare. There's, yeah. there's no comparison. So I, I actually feel a little yeah. bit silly yeah. for, for <laughs> thinking this. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think, yeah. I think, I think the, uh, the safety aspect is, is certainly a, a big part of it as well. I, I remember, I specifically remember my first week here and going to the F10 Markaz. Mm -hmm. And I mean, 
you know, in Afghanistan, people also wear shaba kameez. You yeah. know, if you if you're in downtown Kabul, it's a very similar feeling just from the shops it and so on. It looks like it looks yeah, it but looks it's similar. Not the same. Yeah. And it took me a while to get over that to realize that no, people are totally friendly and and they're like open to foreigners yeah. being there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think the really big surprise for me is just how incredibly diverse this country is. Yeah. I haven't been to a single place in Pakistan yet. Um, that was the same as some other place that I've been to. Really? Whether, whether I mean, every single city I've been to has been completely different. Every single part of the country I've been to has been completely different. I mean, the diversity is just incredible. That's so nice. And you know, like I, I have to say, because I also lived in Kabul, but I had actually been in Pakistan before. Mm. Oh. So for me, it was the other way around. I oh. went to Kabul <laughs> thinking like, ah, it's the same. And then I'm like, oh my God, it's no. not the same. No, it really so, yeah, I can definitely understand that. And it was always so funny for me in Kabul when I met with like foreigners who had not been in Pakistan and they would be like, oh my God, but it's so dangerous right. and people are so extremist. I'm like, what are you talking no, about? No, no, no. <laughs> no. Uh, this, this has been kind of like a, it's almost like a paradise for us because it, it has all the, the cultural things that we really love, but yeah. none of the, None of the danger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's... not only that, but also, I mean, apart from uh, when we met in Afghanistan, Jennifer and I have had actually spent a significant part of our relationship having to live um, separated from each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this exactly. is actually the first time that we've had the opportunity in over two years to live together. So wow. of course, for us, that's, that's amazing. unbeatable. You know. Yeah, so. exactly. So Jennifer, you had a pretty interesting job <laughs> in Kabul. Yes. Like you were working for this, uh, the National Institute of Music. Yes, right. correct. So How did you do that? I, uh, in my previous career, I was a violinist and a violin oh. teacher. So when I was in Afghanistan, I was the only violinist in the country. Oh, wow. So I was teaching the, the young students at the National Institute of Music uh, and also training, helping to train the the junior staff okay. to become the next wow. generation of Afghan teachers. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. How many years did you spend there? Uh, two years. Okay, great. And how was that whole experience? Like these are like most of these kids I've heard they come from like very difficult backgrounds yes. sometimes Correct. and this is the first time they like get the chance to learn an instrument. Yes. Uh, so most or learn of it all for that matter. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. That's a good yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. So most of the kids at the Afghanistan National Institute of Music um, are street kids or street working kids yeah. or orphans or just girls who are, as you know, they're just marginalized yeah. um, from education pretty much everywhere. Mm. Um, and so uh, we worked with a couple of different organizations to identify the street working kids, to work with them to get off of the streets and uh, help the parents to understand the benefits of education. Um, and there was uh, some support given to the families because you know these kids were actually earning all the income for the families. Yeah. So we needed to uh, kind of compensate the parents so that they were still able to eat while mm -hmm. their kids were going to school. Yeah, that's a big issue. Yeah. Right? So it was an extremely, extremely rewarding experience. Wow. Um, and being there uh, really open my eyes to the rest of the world and so mm. as I mentioned after that I decided career change so yeah. I went back to school to study international developments mm. um, and since then I've been working with refugees great and that's what you're doing here as well now well that's what I was doing in Hong Kong okay. um, I was working for a refugee agency there and now I'm helping to put together a migration profile for the Red Cross. Wow. And so I remember, so you said you were in this motorbike club in Kabul. The Kabul Libertines. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I heard you guys did something pretty unusual in Afghanistan before you left. You yeah. took like a trip across the country on motorbike. Can you yeah. tell me a little bit about that? It, it, was, it was pretty epic. So, um, what we did was we uh, I had a I had a relatively large motorcycle for well at least a, a, <laughs> relative for most of the motorcycles in Afghanistan it was relatively large. Yeah. Uh, we shipped it out to Bamiyan, so um, we which had is in the center of the country. Center yeah. of the country exactly, and then we took a flight out, uh, picked up the motorcycle, and then f over the course of uh, three four days, um, we took uh, a tour through the Central Highlands that took wow. us from Bamiyan to Yakalang into Daikundi and Bandar, and then back up into uh, Ghor. Uh, I think it was Lal that we stopped at, and then back 
through Yaokalang all the way back to Bamiyan. Wow. Yeah. Going, of course, to the Bandamir Lakes and all those yeah, other sites the along the way. Yeah, amazing places there. Yeah, so, so these are mainly like Hazara regions. Yeah, so exactly. it was relatively safe, right? It was extremely safe. Yeah. Um, we actually, on one of the final days, we actually took a pretty bad spill and um, realized that because of our injuries and the some things with the bike, we couldn't really go on much further mm. and we were about 50 kilometers away from where we thought we were supposed to be oh. and oh. you know we're in the middle of Afghanistan there are no roads we were yeah. basically driving on this yeah well, uh, I mean, even less than this I mean, less the whole this. the whole route is not accessible in the winter months it's yeah. it's basically you're driving along riverbeds um, that are either filled with water or filled with wow. snow mm -hmm. And, and so the only way to really navigate in the region is by plotting GPS waypoints. Yeah, so it was really just oh kind gosh. of going by, yeah. by GPS navigation. <laughs> so but, usually uh, in Afghanistan, if you find yourself in the wilderness, in the middle of nowhere, that's uh, not a good foreigners, thing. It's not yeah. a good thing, but we were, you know, in the middle of the Hazar Jat and mm. found ourselves in this bazaar that Alex had been to maybe three years prior. Well, no, I mean, I've been there a couple of times actually, yeah, because it was a part of our, our project area. Mm. Um, and it was actually, this is part of the reason why we, we felt safe enough to mm. go and explore the, the region by ourselves because I had taken several trips yeah. into that area before. Okay. And, yeah. uh, you know, the bazaar owner, the, there was a little, you know, inn, so to speak, you know, one of these like truck stops, I suppose you could call <laughs> yeah. it. I mean, it's very, very informal. And, uh, it was and, just a building. and he knew my colleague, so, you know, he was very, very hospitable and he, mm. uh, you know, had us stay and uh, it was it was fine. They organized some transportation that took us yeah. on to Lal and then we continued from there with, uh, with the motorcycle again. Wow. But we were completely safe the whole time. Yeah. And yeah. when we were stuck there in that bazaar that we had not intended to go to. Um, his family came to visit us, they brought oh. us chai, even the police came to check in on us to make sure we were okay yeah. and nobody was harassing us or anything. So it was it oh, was nice. completely, completely yeah. an epic trip. <laughs> wow, that, that sounds wild. Yeah. <laughs> so are you guys planning on doing anything similar here in Pakistan maybe? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> I mean, there's a couple of, uh, of things that we need to sort out. I mean, the two issues that I have is obviously, you know, kind of representing the organization that I mm. do. I do need to kind of lead by example with regard to our security yeah. setup. Yeah. So, you know, motorcycles uh, in a context like this are, are generally frowned upon. So yeah. it's more <laughs> something that we're looking at at the end of the mission, you yeah, know, when course. we're kind of packing up. Yeah. But the other issue is, of course, NOCs. So, yeah. um, I mean, I know that things are, are getting better um, mm. and things are getting easier for foreigners to travel around. Certainly yeah. Jennifer, who's on a tourist visa, gets oh, to yeah, go yeah. anywhere she yeah, wants. That's perfect. But since I'm on an official visa, there's still quite a number of places I need NOCs Yeah, for. and you need to plan ahead. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly. All right. But yeah, so you guys also acquired quite a few pets in <laughs> Afghanistan, right? Yes, we did, yeah. Did you bring them here to Pakistan? Uh, one of them. Okay. So uh, over the course of our, our time in Afghanistan, we inherited, at one point we had uh, three cats, two dogs, a goat, wow, and two a turtles. Goat as well. <laughs> Things just kept happening. Yeah. Um, but in the end, we, we did end up bringing um, the cat that I inherited personally. Uh, she came with us to Bangkok mm -hmm. for a year and then to Hong Kong for two years. And okay. now she is here with us uh, in Pakistan. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's quite an adventure cat too because I mean this cat has not only has it seen more countries than most people but it's also <laughs> I mean we've uh, we were caught in the in the coup in Turkey oh my gosh. Uh, as we were transitioning through Istanbul and then Basically, Fatty, the cat, um, became uh, the comfort animal for everybody in this terminal who was oh uh, nervous about what was happening. And then when she was relocating from Bangkok to Hong Kong, they sent her to the wrong country. Yes. So the airline no. lost Fatty yeah. and sent her to South Korea. Yes. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. So. That's horrifying. As, as Alex said, she spent some, some good time yeah. in uh, the Istanbul airport during mm. the coup. Uh, now she's here and very, very happy because uh, our apartment is Probably we also, double the size of my Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. We also have a, um, a dog that uh, I took out from Afghanistan mm. as well. Um, but uh, she's in Germany. She's in Germany. Okay. She's a little bit too big to kind of go on frequent 
trips yeah. like this. <laughs> and how do you guys feel? Like, I, I think when I was in Afghanistan, I also had a cat there and um, I brought the cat with me <gasps> to Pakistan. Oh, really? So I also have an Afghan <laughs> cat here. But um, I feel like people, like there is a lot more, let's say, awareness here. Like there's all these pet stores yeah. everywhere. Like in Afghanistan, everybody started laughing at the airport when I yeah. was like, I want to take my cat. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, one thing that was really wonderful uh, when I first arrived here uh, was we went to, I don't know, F6 or something, and I saw so many people walking by uh, with dogs on leads, and, yeah. and I thought, yeah. Wow, animals are pets here. Like yeah, people exactly. really love their animals here. So I, you know, for for us, this was an, a nice, yeah, a nice well, thing. To be honest, um, it was for me a real moral dilemma actually taking uh, my dog out of Afghanistan mm. because this was. This was in late 2015, so at the height of the refugee crisis where you had literally yeah. like hundreds of thousands of people from Afghanistan and other parts uh, of the world making their way to Europe. Mm. Um, and I felt very, very self-conscious uh, yeah. to be taking, of all things, a dog Absolutely. out of a Muslim country that, you know, it was, I, I, it took a lot of thinking back and forth what was the right thing to do about uh, in that, under those circumstances. But ultimately, you know, given that I was the only caretaker of the dog and I, and I knew that she was not going to survive by herself. Yeah. It just yeah. it didn't seem right to do anything else. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Actually, we've just adopted a Pakistani cat now. Yeah, we did. So we feel like we're bringing a Afghanistan and Pakistan together. Yeah, <laughs> like me. I also have you a Pakistani do. Oh. cat now. Fantastic. <laughs> they can have some play dates. <laughs> okay. Time to take a short break. See you in a bit. Welcome back. I'm here with Alexander and Jennifer. And yeah, so um, Alexander, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your work here in Pakistan. Like, what does the German Red Cross focus on here particularly? Well, it's, it's a long story. I mean, the German Red Cross has had a partnership with the Pakistan Red Crescent for uh, 26 years at oh, this wow. point. Yeah. Um, no, sorry, 36 years at this point. Yeah, they. they uh, um, established a relation in 1983 um, and have been engaged in all kinds of different work. It depends a little bit always on the kind of uh, funding that's available. Yeah. Um, a lot of uh, the projects that were implemented in the past in pa Pakistan were um, financed with private donations from, oh. from Germany. So okay. I mean, and, you know, you can you can donate to the German Red Cross uh, and a lot of people do that, um, you know, around Christmas or when they have yeah. special uh, campaigns. And, and, and they that, know it's it's coming to Pakistan, the money. Exactly. Oh, that's exactly. nice. Yeah. So I mean, they've, they've done things like uh, um, build up uh, blood uh, donation centers and, and these kind of things as well. Hmm. Um, but the, the work really picked up uh, after the 2005 earthquake and then uh, after the mega floods of 2010 mm. because then not only did we have a huge surge in uh, in donations from uh, from the public in Germany to help with these um, emergencies yeah. but also there were institutional donors uh, most notably the uh, Ministry of uh, Development Corporation in Germany as well as the Foreign Office okay. um, that uh, provided funding to uh, implement projects in, in Pakistan and since then I mean after the uh, relief phase was completed and, and the sort of emergency response was uh, was done, uh, the focus has shifted more on preparing communities uh, in various areas of Pakistan that are particularly vulnerable to different types of emergencies and disasters to be better prepared for the next one, yeah? um, to understand the hazards in their environment, to understand what they as a community can do to mitigate against them, but also to support them in terms of being able to provide first aid, or um, understanding who they need to liaise with within the government to get the government support as well. So it's a lot of sort of development work in that essence, going again at every point through the Pakistan Red Crescent Society. Okay, that's really interesting. And uh, did you get in any way involved in the very recent earthquake that happened in, in the Mirpur area? Uh, indirectly. So yeah. the, the Pakistan Red Crescent Society is, is, is really, really well organized. Um, I think, um, from the uh, national societies that I've had the pleasure of working with, the Pakistan Red Crescent Society is one of the more 
um, better organized when it comes to responding to emergencies. Yeah. Um, and it was very, uh, very impressive and, and very encouraging to um, sort of observe uh, the immediate response that they had uh, to that emergency. They had volunteers that were on the ground in the area right after the earthquake, wow. providing first aid, providing ambulance services, coming in with uh, food and non-food items, even giving uh, cash support, shelter support. So the response was, was really, really good and also the information that they provided to their partners. I mean, it's not just the German Red Cross that works with the Pakistan Red Crescent Society. Yeah. Um, we also have the uh, Danish Red Cross, uh, the Turkish Red Cross, the Norwegian Red Cross and the International Federation of the Red Cross. And so all of these uh, were basically kept abreast of the emergency and it was clear that uh, no additional help was needed. They were perfectly fine covering uh, the response by themselves. So we were just basically on standby in case any additional help was needed. That's amazing. That's yeah. really inspiring as yeah. well. And is it like mostly like volunteer run? The, their operations? Well, I wouldn't say it's volunteer run, but the, the the real backbone of the Red Cross movement in general is the volunteer network. Yeah. yeah. So every national society will have thousands of volunteers placed in all of the communities all over the country uh, who will be educated in first aid response, but sometimes also more uh, technical things um, such as uh, disaster response and the communication that goes into that liaising with the government but it's all volunteer based yeah um, and so you know it might not be run by volunteers mm. but anytime there's an emergency it's the volunteers who are the first to respond yeah that's that's really great and um, which regions in Pakistan do you focus on in particular or is it just all over the country everything it depends a little bit I mean again it depends a little bit on uh, what the needs are both locally but also in terms of what the Red Crescent Society requests mm -hmm. in terms of support from the German Red Cross yeah. um, but also in terms of the available funding I mean sometimes it just so happens that uh, a donor might be interested in a particular area of Pakistan for mm. whatever reasons and then we need to weigh whether that falls within our mandate and whether we can respond to that at the moment just, um, apart from the main office that we have in Islamabad um, we have two additional offices, um, one in Peshawar and one in Karachi. Okay. So we are also doing work in Sindh and KP. Um, and uh, until the summer this year, we were also present in Gilgit, Baltistan, but that project uh, was completed successfully um, just two months ago. Okay, yeah. great. And uh, Have you gotten to travel to any of these project sites where you're working? Yeah, I've been extremely fortunate that my work lets me travel to uh, uh, a lot of different places uh, as, as part of uh, the sort of monitoring that goes into the, the project. So um, I've been to Peshawar, I've been to Swat, Shangla, Kohistan, um, I've been down to Karachi. I haven't had a chance to visit uh, more rural areas of uh, um, Sindh yet. I mean, we have uh, projects in Badin district, for example, yeah. that I haven't seen yet, but I'm looking forward to doing that in the near future as well. Mm. Uh, and I'm also really looking forward to a trip just next week uh, where I will be going to the inauguration of a branch building that uh, was uh, uh, constructed with the help of the German Red Cross in Chitral. So uh, that will also be something of a highlight, I think, for me. Yeah. yeah. What, was there like any particular trip that like really impressed you or that you thought like, wow, what an amazing place or what an amazing project? I mean, honestly, I've been impressed over and over and over again, yeah. you know, but both for the, the professional travel as well as for the, the personal travel. Mm. I mean, I think I was, uh, I was saying that um, previously, it, it's, it's just mind boggling to me that this one country has so many different faces. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, if you talk about just the cities, for example, yeah. and you compare Islamabad with just the Twin City, right? I mean, it's a stone Rabble throw Pindi, away, yeah. Rabal Pindi. <laughs> completely different, completely different exactly. vibe, completely different, you know, scenery. Uh, and the same again with uh, Peshawar. Peshawar reminded me a lot of uh, cities in, uh, in, in, in Eastern Afghanistan, yeah. for example. And Karachi, I mean, it's it's a Gulf city. I mean, it's it, with skyscrapers and the harbor and the train station. I mean, it's really a, a metropolis in that sense. So. Everywhere I've been, it's been completely different, completely different sense. And the same goes for the countryside. I mean, this, the south with the, its deserts and arid regions, and then the north with its beautiful mountains. And then you've got Islamabad in between with the beautiful Margala Hills yeah. and, and forests and grasslands. I mean, it's, it's just really impressive. That's amazing. And what about you, Jennifer? Have you gotten to travel at all here yet? Uh, I haven't had much of a chance yet. Uh, we've been to Taxila, hmm. to Murray, and um, to 
Rawal Pandey, which okay. I really liked. Yeah. Um, really looking forward to many, many places. Um, for our wedding anniversary, in just mm. a few weeks, we're wow. having a trip to Lahore. Amazing. And um, my number one place to visit is Baluchistan, which I don't know if I will be able to, yeah. but most of my most of my research was in Kuwait. Okay. So, yeah. um, looking forward to Fascinating. seeing this part of the country. Yeah. yeah, great. So I was just wondering, like for both of you guys, I mean, you've spent so much time abroad in so many different countries. Like, what do, would you be able to say what it is that keeps you going to places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, and whatever? <laughs> Difficult question. Yeah. Maybe maybe we're just a little insane. I don't yeah. know. Uh, in a good way. In a, in a, in a good. It's curiosity. Yeah. It's yeah. it's going off the unbeaten path. It's going to places that not a lot of people get to go. I think it's just curiosity, really. Yeah. And also, you know, um, being able to do the work that we do. Um, sure, I'm sure we could do development work and really work in our own countries, but. Yeah. Uh, it seems like if you get to experience somebody else's culture and immerse yourself in an unfamiliar culture, it's, it's all the more rewarding. Um, I don't know, I just find being outside of home is just, it's more, a, a more rich experience. Um, being uncomfortable, uh, I, I feel like just gives you so many more experiences. Yeah. It like pushes you yeah, a little absolutely. bit. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. it's 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 also interesting because uh, Jennifer and I started traveling or or began international lives at very very different yeah. phases in our lives. Okay. Um, and I mean, that has a lot to do also with how we feel about going back to, for example, Germany or or the U.S. Mm. Um, and I mean. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, for, for Jennifer, she didn't leave until uh, her early 20s. Mm. Um, and and that was a real sort of mind-opening experience um, that kind of widened her horizon to a point that it didn't fit inside the US anymore. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Um, and for me, I never, I never knew that constraint because I grew up in so many different countries. But um, my parents always made the effort uh, that my sister and I, we should speak German at home, for example. Yeah. So they raised us as Germans, quintessentially, you, yeah. you could say. But I had... And I was raised as an Asian and in America, were, yeah. so <laughs> my mom is Japanese. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was raised in a completely opposite way in my own country. Yeah. But then, I mean, ultimately for me, it, it led to a lot of uh, also misconceptions about what it meant to be German, what it meant to be European. And so, uh, you know, the first time in my life that I really uh, encountered or experienced culture shock was when I when I went to Germany at the age of 19 to live there really? and <laughs> really had to readjust what you know in my mind what it meant to be German what my identity was etc cetera, etc cetera. and since then I, I think I can live basically everywhere except Germany because really? <laughs> it, being a foreigner is such a central part of my identity right. That's that it feels weird to be in this place where I look the same, I speak the same, nobody identifies me for the person that I feel I am. Yeah. Wow. And for me, I guess it's just, um, I kind of look like I'm from everywhere. Yeah. Like I, I, yeah. I could be from here, I could be from Afghanistan, I could exactly. be from Hong Kong. Um, and it, for me, it's not so much living in a foreign country as it is just uh, getting more world experience. Right. Um, and I, I guess I just, I, I, we're world citizens. Yeah, yeah, say. definitely. Yeah. Maybe that's cheesy, but. <laughs> no, um, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so, so where is home for you then? I mean. It's here. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that's very cute. I, no, I can't say anything. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm not gonna ask you. <laughs> and so you said like, for you going to Germany was actually more of a culture shock than, for example, coming here. What about you? Was was Pakistan a culture shock for you in any way? No, um, it, it was more like a, a really nice surprise at how easy things are here, <laughs> yeah. actually. Um, for me, uh, like Alex, when I go back to the States, it's, it's always a bit of a challenge for mm. me because um, I feel like I don't really fit in anymore um, in in that type of context. But yeah. coming here was like, oh, I kind of understand how, yeah. how things work, and um, you know, I think Pakistan's a pretty easy place to just kind of 
slot into. Yeah. Um, well, especially given your experience with Afghanistan mm, and, yeah, yeah. and the wider exactly. region. Yeah. 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 And, you know, for us, you know, the, the, the little bit of traveling around that we've been able to do has been really delightful. So, like, for example, we went to Rawalpindi on this photo tour and we were going through the, the bazaar there and and everybody thought he was a celebrity. Oh my god, um, really? <laughs> I don't know, I guess there's some vlogger or something that looks like him and so... And I had like, a big camera. So. Yeah, right. so everywhere we went people were taking pictures of him and like coming up and... <laughs> <laughs> like nobody would let us pay for anything and it was yeah and, and it, not in a creepy way or anything yeah. it was just so welcoming and and delightful that people it just seems like uh pakistan really welcomes foreigners yeah. and really uh embraces us and yeah more for that, more more for that. i think they're, they're they're really hungry for people to come yeah, yeah. and it, and it's great because you know, the, the big misconception around the world is that this is some scary place exactly. and it's, it's totally yeah, not. It's, it's not, yeah. It's just welcoming and wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And I noticed you're obviously very comfortable oh. in shalwar kameez. I mean, um, how is how is it different from what you used to wear in Afghanistan, for example? Oh. <laughs> well, um, I think for one thing here, oh, this, this is something that was surprising for me. Is yeah. I was... When I came here, I was like, oh, it's no problem. I'm, I'm used to dressing hijab, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I got here and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so drab. Everybody here is so colorful. And people, yeah. like women dress in such vibrant colors and I only wear black and navy blue <laughs> and I have to <laughs> change something. Um, here, it just seems women are so fashionable and mm -hmm. wearing wearing the shawar kobis is not at all a restrictive yeah. thing. It's it's. It's just fashion. Super expressive. So, you know, my friends back home, they're all like, oh, do you have to wear a burqa? And I'm like, like oh my gosh, really. no, I have to change my whole wardrobe because I'm the least fashionable person in town. I need to yeah. learn how to wear makeup now. And Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, for me, the clothing here is it's fantastic. Yeah. And it's very, uh, just very flattering yeah. for pretty much exactly. anybody. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's so good for the hot weather as yes. well. It's so comfortable. Yes. I love it. No, I, I frequently send pictures home to my girlfriends um, and they always comment on how, well, you really had to add some color to your wardrobe yeah. <laughs> going out there. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, you it's stand true. out in a, in a strange way if you're not if you're not wearing something, yeah. Joyfully dressed. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's just a nice thing about yeah. like Pakistani culture, like all the colors. Yes. Mm. Especially after Afghanistan. I mean, there are areas like Kandahar where you see like really like especially men wearing like very oh, colorful yeah. full, um, shalwar kameez. But otherwise, I think maybe it was like a foreigner thing. But I used to wear like you always like black. You didn't want to draw too much attention. No, here, definitely so, not. So. No. Yeah. Now here, I I feel like the the style of dressing is very joyful and vibrant, and the people. You know, everybody smiles, yeah. so the people are joyful and vibrant too. So, yeah, I think the no culture shock coming in here. Yeah. It was just, it's just a nice, uh, a nice surprise mm -hmm. at how how easy things are. Mm -hmm. Great, but yeah. So, what do you guys do here in your free time here in Islamabad aside from coming to F9 Park? <laughs> Um, brunches uh, with friends and various organizations in the UN. Um, we're trying to explore as many different restaurants as yeah. possible. Um, coming from Hong Kong, food is very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're exploring uh, these different things. Um, what else could we do? Well, I mean, uh, I, I don't have quite as much free time as, uh, as Jennifer has, yeah. uh, at, at least not during the week. Um, but yeah, we, we do try on, on the weekends also to just kind of find little places in Islamabad that are a little bit more off the beaten track. Mm. I mean, I think the sort of F6, F7, I mean, that's kind of generic, you yeah. know, as, as well as the F9 park. We're very, very fortunate to have this basically across the street from where we live. Yeah. Um, but no, we do also like to go on little uh, trips. I mean, obviously the Manal is one of those places that we like to go for special occasions. Recently, we actually went down that road along the Magala Hills for a little bit further until we got to oh. something called the Highland Resort, which oh, we really yeah. enjoyed. That's amazing, yeah. Um, so yeah, no, we, we generally just like to explore and, and, and find cute little uh, nooks here yeah. and there, yeah. And, you know, Alex loves to drive, and so we try to 
as he said, go exploring as much as we can within his <laughs> <laughs> within his uh, NOC yeah. area. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, once once his restrictions are lifted a bit, then I we're really really keen to see the rest of the country. Yeah, yeah. great. But yeah, I think it's getting closer to lunchtime soon. What do you guys think if we go find some nice restaurant nearby? Sounds good. Yeah. 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 Great. Great. Time to take a short break. See you in a bit. Welcome back. We've just come to this restaurant with Alexander and Jennifer and yeah, let's take a look what they have here. Have you been here before? No. No, we see it a lot when we come through the Marcos, but this yeah. is the first time we've come. Yeah, for me as but well. But we've heard it's good. Yeah. Let's see. So, um, do you have any favorites in Pakistani food? Well, I'm a huge fan of uh, Palak Paneer. Uh, yeah, I, I can't get enough of that. And of course, a nice dal. But I think a barbecue is... Yeah. yeah. I think let's go for barbecue today. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's okay. take the regular yeah. barbecue platter. Perfect. More so then we get to yeah. try a little bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Great. So, um, but you're obviously not vegetarian. No, no, no. Not in the least bit. Not in the least bit. I think no. it'd be difficult. That could be. In yeah. yeah. And what else have you gotten to try here? Ooh, I mean, all, a whole bunch of stuff. I, I love some of the street foods, like, you know, the samosas yeah. and the pakora and yeah. that kind of stuff that you can get. Uh, obviously, the different types of uh, curries that you can get are really delicious. The and surprise for me is the variety of Chinese food. Oh, yeah? <laughs> so, coming from Hong Kong, I was not expecting to have such good, real, authentic Chinese yeah. food here. But uh, we've been to a few places um, for uh, Uyghur cuisine, which is... Uh, I think pretty special. Yeah. yeah I think one of the biggest surprises is also just uh, the kind of uh, bread mix that you get here, right? Yeah. Because we're big fans of obviously the Afghan naan from like the mm. tandoor, but here you also get the the rotis and the chapatis and like all these you different things. I mean, it's yeah. And then there's even with like naan, you get like garlic naan, cheese naan, yeah. this and that, and there's so much more variety. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. I think we're gonna put on a couple. Pounds. This is not a diet <laughs> country. I no. Think. Well, I don't know for me it's been like different because here you get to be a little bit more active than in Afghanistan yeah, so true. that might balance it out a little bit for you <laughs> yeah hopefully <laughs> but yeah so that's cool and you know what you mentioned about the Chinese restaurants that's really interesting because I think that's something that's happened in like very recently actually. oh okay because so many Chinese people have come to Pakistan with the CPAC route that they're oh, building okay, right. and before there used to be like this um, kind of like a fusion between okay. um, Indian Pakistani food and Chinese food which is very different from right. like authentic and it was it was difficult to find authentic Chinese food here so yeah. I've been I've been so happy um, and actually it's kind of unusual but a lot of our neighbors are Chinese oh yeah so for, for me it, it's just it's ironic when I was in Hong Kong we speak Cantonese. Oh yeah. And I never I never learned Mandarin in the whole time I was there and then I come here and we hear people speaking Mandarin in our yeah. whole day all the time. <laughs> um, and the food is it's proper. Is it is the food sort of different in different areas of China as yes, well? Definitely. Um, I there are probably more types of cuisine in China than uh, countries oh of the gosh, world yeah, yeah wow um, so the the Xinjiang food that you get here is uh, very very distinctive because um, it's more of the the Muslim food you know they um, you know in most parts of China pork is you know oh, eaten, yeah. the, the, the main protein but in Xinjiang um, they eat a lot of beef and chicken and that sort of thing so you have the kind of the Central Asia influences on the food yeah, there, yeah, yeah. and so that's a really special kind, and you see a lot of it here in Islamabad. So it's a big treat. <laughs> yeah. And what about you? I mean, are you a fan of traditional German food at all, or <laughs> you don't care much about I, that? You know, I mean, it's hard not to be a fan of traditional German food. Yeah. I, think. I mean, it's it's a real comfort food if you think about like the sausages and the schnitzels and the sauerkraut and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, sure, absolutely. But I wouldn't seek it out, you know? Right. Like, if I heard that there was a German restaurant here, I'd be like, 
Uh, okay, fine. Like, you know, whatever, yeah. There's, there's plenty of other stuff to eat, you know? Um, but uh, no, I, I think I think there's uh, also just a really good uh, offering of, of other Western cuisine here that you can find very easily. So there's not really a whole lot to miss. Yeah. yeah. And I think since there are so many different kinds of Pakistani food, we'll never exhaust the options, it yeah. seems. There's yeah. always something new to try, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> there are a lot more restaurants here than I was expecting. Yeah, really. And I think that's also something you've come at a good time to Islamabad because when I first arrived here, there wasn't that much variety, really. But now there's like, especially this area where we are right now, F10, this has developed a lot. Like oh, this okay. has become like this hub for like all these cool restaurants here. So yeah. But I, I really feel nice. also that the restaurants that we've come across, especially the ones that serve sort of genuine foreign food, like the, the Chinese restaurants or some of the Western places or so on, to me, they seem to really cater predominantly to the expat community. Yeah. Um, I've had a couple of uh, situations also with my, my colleagues at the office uh, who are quite skeptical uh, about any type of like non-Pakistan food that isn't sort of Western fast food. Oh, Do you yeah? know what I mean? Yeah. So like offering a salad, for example, is very, very strange, but like the chicken burger, fine, you yeah. know? And so <laughs> Jennifer and I, we've, we've been to a couple of restaurants where you know, they look really nice, but then they tend to serve the same type of Western food yeah. when they're catering more to uh, the Pakistani crowd. Exactly. As opposed to like expats, where you then find the more genuine sort of uh, cuisine that, that you Absolutely. have. Absolutely. Well, uh, yeah, that's very true. But yeah, so did you get to taste any like any of the regional specialties on your travels, like in Peshawar or anywhere else? Oh my gosh, Peshawar is actually a really good uh, case in point. Um, so I knew from Afghanistan chapli kebabs. Oh yeah? But the ones that they make in Peshawar are just phenomenal. Yeah, I, they're famous. It's just so tasty, yeah. but very greasy, but very, very tasty. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see what we get now. I have no idea what's on our... So we're getting a lot of visitors as well. There's another one coming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Probably. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh, this is huge. That's Whoa. one heck of a platter. <laughs> but yeah, let's start. All right. All right. Go for it. Do you want some of this? Sure. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Honey? Yes, please. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This looks really Flexing. yummy. Excellent. And this is like enough to feed a family. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, let's dig in. Yeah. So I don't see any chocolate kebabs here, but no, <laughs> it's okay, something though. else. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll be passing through Peshawar next week. I'll have a chance to get some mm, more. Yummy. Mm. This is so good. Mm -hmm. I mean, the cats want it. <laughs> But yeah, so I mean, this is kind of, at least for you, the first country that's not like a, an active conflict zone after so many years. Do that you is true. do you think you will have some of your friends or your family come visit you here? Um, I'm fairly optimistic. Yeah, I mean, uh, I keep uh, I keep advertising, you know, Pakistan as you know the traveler's El Dorado. Yeah, really. Um, <laughs> My parents are considering it. Uh, my sister definitely wants to come visit at some point. I've got some other friends who are lined up. But to be honest with you, a lot of my friends are also just at the moment busy having children. And so yeah. they're kind of tied up <laughs> with other priorities than yeah, traveling. Yeah, of course. And it's maybe at this point, not yet, like exactly like a child friendly travel destination because it's a little bit tough to travel, especially to the remote areas, I would say. I've got a bunch of friends who are interested in coming, not not with kids, but um, you know, especially from Hong Kong, the visa is super, super easy and um, people are pretty adventurous coming from, from there. Mm. Um, and it's also a great launching point for the rest of the stands. Of course. For a lot of people who want to do overland trips and that sort of thing, like this is a really great staging post yeah. for that sort of travel. That's amazing. But yeah, so most of the people you've interacted with have been like in a work kind of an environment. Yeah, and I mean, I, I can't blame them for not inviting their boss out for dinner and yeah. that kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> and I mean, there have been other um, 
the Pakistanis that I've met that I've gotten along with really well, but it's always been sort of like friends of friends. And then somehow uh, the next uh, opportunity didn't present itself to kind of like meet up with them again. But mm. um, um, and for me, um, I just haven't been here long yeah, enough. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's just you're only this, starting to get to know people. <laughs> exactly. Uh, right now. I'm here for three weeks and this is my longest stretch. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> longest by by quite yeah. a lot. <laughs> no, that's really nice. But yeah, still, I mean, you must um, get to interact with Pakistanis in general on a daily basis. Yeah. So what would you say is like, how would you describe Pakistanis? Genuinely friendly and helpful. Yeah. It's it's not even like a, a big special thing. It's just people, it's yeah, just normal exactly. here. Yeah. yeah, people are, People. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Actually, you know what the thing is uh, also that by and large, at least the uh, the people that we've met so far, even like strangers in the street, generally speaking, uh, they tend to be well educated and 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 have a good grasp of English, which means it's so much easier to kind of like exchange a couple words, Absolutely. you know, and find out about them, and they're always very curious about us and very welcoming as well. Yeah. So I mean, the hospitality has just been really, really great. Yeah. So have you noticed any unexpected? similarities between your culture and Pakistani culture, maybe? <laughs> well, yeah, I think there are big, there are more differences than there are similarities. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think, generally speaking, um, the sort of focus on family life <clears throat> is so much more predominant <clears throat> than anywhere in, in Europe or the West in general, I'd say, you know? Absolutely. I mean, I, I come from a, a nuclear family, you know? I've got my parents and I've got my sister, <clears throat> and that's it. And and here, I mean, like, you know, your cousin's third, I don't know what, uh, twice removed, is still considered part of, like, the inner circle in, in a way. And um, it's 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 really refreshing, I think, to, to, to see um, how how important family is yeah. here. I mean, sure, you can talk about the so, sort of socio-political exactly. context of that, fine. Mm. But I think that's one of those things that, that you know, is really lacking in, in sort of modern Western life is, is you know, the importance of, of the family mm. as, a, as, a, as a structure. Yeah. Yeah. I agree, yeah. And what about, like, let's say Chinese or the culture in Hong Kong? Like, are there any any different big differences like you would imagine that it's also quite family focused the whole concept of people staying together with their families for much much longer another similarity is that there there does seem to be a big emphasis on food culture and mm -hmm. then being you know things taking place centered around food yeah um, cool. that's very very similar yeah. uh, in Hong Kong as it is as it is here it seems to be yeah yeah very nice yeah I think the other thing is also just how how private Pakistanis tend to be so it's interesting you know you on the on the one hand you're you're always uh, confronted with people being very very hospitable very warm very welcoming um, but uh, I'll give you an example we we recently had a um, uh, a staff retreat mm -hmm. and uh, it was a really fun day we played cricket we had barbecue and stuff like that and um, I had offered that um, colleagues could feel free to bring their their family members to this event um, but it was ultimately an offer as as well received as the offer itself was nobody really opted to do that because there was a very sort of okay this is work these are my work people and then there's my family and that's that's different mm. you know yeah um, which is something uh, I think again you know in Europe yeah, sure, you would bring your wife or your children to do something like that. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that is a difference. But yeah, so how long do you think you're going to stay in Pakistan still? Oh, good question. Um, well, there's a couple things to consider. Obviously, in my line of work, uh, the position is always dependent on the available funding and the projects that are being implemented. Yeah. And so the planning horizon there is never particularly long. We're always talking about one, two or three years, depending. Exactly. You know? um, but that said, I think, I think we're, we're very happy to, you know, be here. To stay until it's time for us to be somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're very comfortable at the moment. Um, so uh, yeah, no, I think I think at least at least uh, 2021. Let's see. Yeah. Great. Okay. So it's time for our rapid fire round. You can both answer. Ooh. Whoever we has an answer buzzer. quicker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Shalwar kameez or a suit? For me, shalwar kameez. Depends on the occasion. True. <laughs> Good answer. 
Lahore or Karachi? Well, we haven't been to Lahore yet, so it's a difficult one to, yeah. to say. Yeah. Um, I'll say Lahore because we're going there next week. Okay. okay. In, in a week. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, cricket or football? Cricket. Football. Really? Do you know much about cricket? Uh, enough. Yeah. <laughs> Surprising. I don't know anything. <laughs> he played it once. <laughs> All right, that's more than enough. That's cool. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, chicken biryani or dal? Oh, dal. Biryani. Oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Um, Atan or Punjabi Bhangra? Atan. Yeah, Atan. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you haven't seen a really nice Bhangra. Right? Oh. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't take sides. So. <laughs> okay. Islamabad or Kabul? Ooh. Islamabad. For for the for the standard of living, hands down. Yeah. Islamabad. Cool. New York or Hong Kong? Hong, Hong Kong. Kong. Wow. <laughs> awesome. I have to go one day. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Mountains or beach? Mountains. Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are you guys travelers or bookworms? Travelers. travelers. The best thing about Pakistan? The nature. Yeah. And all of the green. The diversity. Yeah. Cool. Great. Okay. So then it's time for you guys to sign our visitors book. Here you go. You can both write your names and comments. Why don't you go ahead? Bahut shukriya, Pakistan Zindabad, love from Hong Kong, Gayao. What does that yeah. mean? It means at oil. Oh. It's what we say uh, to keep going and keep strong. Oh, awesome. Okay. And then Alexander, a pearl of South Asia. I cannot wait to explore the country far and wide. And thank you so much thank for so spending much. this wonderful afternoon with me. It it's was been a lovely pleasure. to have you. Thank you and so much. I hope you continue to enjoy your time in Pakistan. I'm sure we will. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. That's it for today. Please join me again next week. Goodbye.